Good afternoon and welcome to Coral Evensong according to the Book of Common Prayer. Welcome to St. James's Church Piccadilly as we continue to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead this Eastertide. With great thanks to the St. James's singing scholars and singers, we hope that you will enjoy the service and that you will join in all of the parts of the service in bold type. We remain seated for the Easter anthems. Christ Apostle is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. Lord, bring me all to heaven, all with the level of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened 
to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduringly patient and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place until you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, these are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have affliction. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death.
There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so and no one can cross from there to us. He said, then father, I beg you to send him to my father's house for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.
Let us pray. God of eternity and time, we give you thanks for the wonders of creation and for the gift and mystery of the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. We give thanks for the gift of your gospel, for the gift of your word and sacrament, and for the generations who have prayed in this place before us. Give us grace and give us the eyes of faith that we might see your world as you see it, that we might know glimpses of resurrection in our own lives and the reality of eternal life in the world we live in today. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the Church of God throughout the world in every continent, denomination and language. For all to whom we are bound by our baptism. We pray for all across continents and centuries who have followed the risen Christ in their own lives. And we pray that we might do the same. We pray for all who are persecuted for their faith. We give thanks for the privilege of public worship. And we pray especially for the church in this city and in this borough of Westminster. We pray for our partner church, St Pancras and St Bart's in New York, giving thanks for a shared journey of faith. Each history of ours, O God, is the history of all, for no church is an island entire to itself. For the fire of thy servants in far centuries, thy name be praised, O God. For ancient stones and liturgies, for ripened learning and long disciplines of prayer and peace, thy name be blessed, O God. And every saint, O God, preserve, renew, and multiply in the eternal Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. We pray for the world we live in, giving thanks for the many blessings of life on earth, for the astonishing gift of life itself, in all its abundance and variety in the created order. We give thanks that the heavens are telling the glory of God in the middle of this city, even in the middle of this day. We pray for human beings in the midst of all this teeming creation. We give thanks for the variety and blessing of all humanity. And we pray most especially for those who are suffering this day injustice, violence, displacement, disfigurement, and war. We continue to pray at this time for the people of Gaza, for the people of the West Bank, for the people of Israel. For the people of Sudan, Ukraine, Myanmar, the Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We pray for all those who suffer the indignity and injustice and violence of war. We pray for those whose stories are not told, whose graves are unmarked.
and with all God's people we cry for justice and for peace in the whole earth. Eternal God, help us to entrust the past to your mercy, the present to your love, and the future to your wisdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. And at this service of Evensong, we pray for all those who've asked us to pray for them. We gather up in our prayers those who have no one to pray for them. We pray for our parish and for each person who has passed through the doors of this place in the past week. We join all our prayers with those that have been left here, written, spoken, whispered, or silent. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who wake or watch or weep this night. And give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend your sick ones, O Lord Christ. Rest your weary ones. Bless your dying ones. Soothe your suffering ones. Pity your afflicted ones. And shield your joyous ones. And all for your love's sake. O Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen.
Eastertide is an ideal time to meditate on not only what draws us together vertically, heaven and earth, and horizontally across communities of many kinds, but also, even in this time of rejoicing and renewal as the first flowers of spring appear, what keeps us apart and why that happens, what that feels like and what it is. We certainly see a quite extreme example of that in our second reading today. Here we have someone who is very wealthy and yet has so little. And it reminded me of a marvelous sermon that took place many, many years ago in a different country for a very different reason. The year was 1906, and it was at St. Thomas's Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Some of you may have been there. It's now a gigantic, very impressive looking Gothic church that kind of looks like a bit of a cathedral amongst all of the skyscrapers in the middle of New York. But in 1906, it was a ruin because the earlier church had burned down. And so the rector was doing what any rector would do. The rector was fundraising. <laughs> and naturally, all the other clergy joined in too. It had to be a massive group effort because they also had some deep decisions to make about what kind of church they wanted. Would they do what St. James's did and rebuild more or less like for like, but with some interesting changes following the devastation that took place here after the Second World War? Or would they do something radically different and new? St. Thomas's kind of went for a middle way because they decided that their earlier Gothic revival church was nice, but simply not nice enough. So they wanted the same style, but a much fancier one. And that's exactly eventually what they got. There were, of course, arguments with the architect, arguments between the people who were in charge of the project. It took a lot longer, it was more expensive. The architectural firm themselves, in fact, broke up they kind of split up over this project and it was all announced in the New York press and it was all a big drama. But ultimately, they had a beautiful church in the end and a beautiful community that just like ours and every other Christian community is learning how to love, how to walk together, how to be with God, how to be with each other. And so in 1906, that rector's sermon, as he looked out at his Manhattan very wealthy, as it still is, primarily, congregation, included this. Some people have too much, and they know it. Some people have too much, and they don't know it. And you, he said to his congregation at the time, are rich in some ways, but very poor in others. What are you going to do about it? In the context of fundraising for a building project, that's an interesting thing to say. But the point that he was making was, in connection to that, and also in connection to the wider community and to the demographic of people that he had in front of him that day, it was a pretty powerful thing to say, because what he wanted them to do in the midst of the ruin of their building was to imagine a new kind of community as well as imagining a new kind of physical space and maybe some music and some liturgy to go along with it over a long haul, which it was, and in any community, it still is. And this came to mind when I was thinking about Ephesus in particular in our first reading from Revelation. There are a series of churches to, uh, towards whom very intimate, very personal messages are addressed. And so for Christians reading this section of Revelation, it's a bit through the keyhole. I wonder from time to time whether or not these communities would really want us to know 2,000 years later what was pretty dysfunctional about them, what didn't work so well, what seemed to be falling apart. 
And in Ephesus in particular, something very interesting is happening. Ephesus, as some of you will know, was a really wealthy city. It was the largest city in Asia. It's the Ephesus of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And so in the middle of this enormous amount of wealth and resources, there's a massive temple to Artemis. There's a lot going on in this place. It's a port city. It's highly capitalistic. There's this fledgling community of people who are following Jesus, and they're trying to live differently in the middle of the tensions that make them quite countercultural in the rest of their everyday lives. And they're having a really hard time. And so this is a kind of candid moment where they're being told what they're great at, and also perhaps a little bit like a report card or an academic supervision, what they're great at and maybe what they're not so great at, needs improvement. They're great at a lot of things. And it starts with this idea of the kind of work they do and how they do it and why they do it. I know, they're told, how hard you work, how much you endure, the way that you do so patiently, that you try to be ethical, that you've encountered a lot of confusing claims to leadership and different sorts of power and ultimately have decided that you still know that Jesus is in the center of things and you're trying to figure that out with pressures all around you. I'm paraphrasing here, as you can tell. And that thing about patient endurance comes up more than once. So clearly, they've had to endure an awful lot and they've had to dig deep for an awful lot of patience. but something's happening in the center of it which is not working out so well. The way that it's put here in this translation, they have abandoned the love that they had at first. In Greek, this is agape love. So this is community love. Love for one another that is going to be able not only to sustain and to create situations of hope and encouragement and trust, all of those good things, but which is also probably, because love has this quality about it too, going to create some maybe painful conversations. The relationship between love and accountability and courage and trust is very close, especially in communities like this one. So the way that it looks, is that they're a very big church in a very big city, all things considered, and they're doing everything they can. It looks like they're doing everything right, but they've forgotten the central purpose of their gathering, love for God, love for one another, and perhaps love of self as well. And especially at Eastertide, it can be helpful to make a connection between the love that's taking place in the context of this little moment, or through the keyhole into this community long ago and far away, and the third chapter of John. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we might have eternal life. It's that love. I was taking a, a road trip a long time ago, and there was a billboard along the highway. It was a highway because it was a road trip in North America, so not a motorway. And I'm pretty sure that this is a billboard that you would never find in the UK ever. See what you think. It was just this giant thing, and all it had on it was John 3.16. It had no other context at all. It was in massive, uh, yes, we have one American who finds this extremely funny for obvious reasons. It had no context at all. It was just John 3.16. And at the time, I'd been Christian for a while, and I cared deeply about scripture, but I really couldn't pull that one out of the air. I was like, I really don't know what, I just, I, I don't know. It could have said Revelation 2, 1 to 11, and I would have been like, yeah, okay, sure. But of course, this is a foundational verse in the New Testament. It's a verse that people have tattooed on their bodies, carry with them like scriptural nourishment in their proverbial pocket in their heart. It's that passage, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that we might have eternal life. 
And so to claim in this passage, as the writer does, that that's the kind of love that this group of people have lost is a really big deal. But all is not lost. Remember what it was like before. Try to recover it and reclaim it. See it in one another differently. Let it break your heart as well as remake your heart. And then see what you can do. Last night, I spent time with someone I had never met before. She was a friend of a friend. And she was talking about what it's like to be in her early 40s, something to which I can relate. And she said that she's worked for the same charity for over 15 years, and it's a charity supporting people with alcohol addiction. And the way that she described it and her role was really inspiring, both gentle and genuine. And I said, you've been there for a long time. What keeps you there? You wake up in the morning and you think, this is what I do. What keeps it fresh? And her face changed and her voice changed. And she took a long sip of her drink and she put it down and she looked at me and she said, actually, nothing. I believe in the community and I believe in the work, but I have been there for a long time and I am absolutely exhausted and I don't see clients face to face anymore. I'm a manager, I'm one of the directors of this organization and I'm probably burnt out, but I can't think of anything else to do. And I love the principle and the concept, but I cannot get that same sense of love and inspiration when I wake up in the morning. I cannot do it. And though I didn't say this to her at the time, because then we had lots to talk about, about who she was and how she was doing, I thought, of course, about this reading and about what I might share with you today. Burnout is real. If you are exhausted, or if you ever have been, if recovering and remembering that sense of first love in community, in relationship, in your work, seems elusive, there are ways back into it. But if you just keep doing the same thing, all those good works, the toil, even with patient endurance, without that sense of reflection, of prayer, of coming home to the center of things, you may find that you, f you may find it very difficult to recover that core of first love. And our capacity to love at all is because, as scripture tells us, God first loved us. We learn about love by learning about God. In our worship, in this stellar music, really beautiful, thank you all so much. In our prayers, in our talking with one another, eating together, connecting with one another in community, in all of those things, we can renew and refresh our love for one another. There's a beautiful book that some of you may know. It's short which sometimes I really like about books. It's by a philosopher named Gillian Rose. And she wrote this book while she was dying of cancer. It's one of her most famous works as a philosopher, and it's called Love's Work. And it very recently came out as a Penguin classic, so there was a celebration for this book a few days ago. And when I was there, we were reminded by the panel, which included Rowan Williams, who was a friend of Gillian Rose, that love is work. But it is not work that we can do alone, or that we do alone. And so I'd like to close by reading to you from Gillian Rose's book, Love's Work. 
exceptional, edgeless love effaces the risk of relation, that mix of exposure and reserve, of revelation and reticence. It commands the complete unveiling of the eyes, the transparency of the body. It denies that there is no love without power, that we are at the mercy of others and that we have others in our mercy. And then she says, in the context of the cancer from which she is dying, surrounded by her friends and relearning what love is like. She says, I reach for my favorite whiskey bottle and instruct my well-wishers to take my supplements, the shark's oil and aloe vera themselves. If I am to stay alive, I am bound to continue to get love wrong all the time, but not to cease trying, for that is my life affair. Love's work. Amen. During our final hymn, we'll be taking a collection. Please do use the tap donations that are available. If you have cash, there are the gift aid envelopes on the pews, and there are tap donations as you leave the church as well. Please give as you're able. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted.
support the weak, help the afflicted, honour all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this night and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.